very pleased to have you all uh, join us for today's webinar in these uncertain and fast developing um, pandemic uh, times. Um, we want to acknowledge the uh, extraordinary efforts that we are uh, hearing about daily from clients and folks in the industry, uh, healthcare providers, professionals, staff, and organizations that are uh, putting in uh, just superhuman efforts to prepare and respond to this crisis. Um, this webinar is uh, the first in a series that we're putting together to highlight um, information and insights that we believe will be useful to the industry in helping to manage the, the uh, effects of, of the pandemic on um, our clients and the industry. Um, as you may note from the title slide, the focus of this webinar has evolved somewhat. Uh, this is in response to really two uh, key developments. One is feedback from many of, of our clients and contacts uh, throughout the industry in terms of where their needs were uh, and a recognition of um, the, the the volume of uh, resources uh, that have been um, put out already on clinical developments. We anticipate revisiting uh, clinical and other um, key topics in the coming weeks, again, to help our uh, industry um, members um, deal with this crisis. With that, um, I'd like to introduce today's panel. Um, we've convened a, a experienced uh, group of uh, industry experts. Um, the first off is uh, John Bain. John is the president of Stratwater Revenue Cycle Solutions, um, which was founded in 2015 to help clients navigate uncertain times and resulting financial stress. Um, John has 25 years of healthcare experience um, financial management and consulting. Um, his focus has been on re revenue cycle improvement initiatives, strategic pricing, hospital and physician practice management, uh, and he has extensive experience with solo practitioners, large group practices, um, small community hospitals, and large academic institutions. Prior to joining Stradwater, John was Associate Director of Revenue Control and Payment Systems uh, for the Leahy Clinic in Burlington, Massachusetts. Um, Joining John will be uh, Cindy Wicks. Um, Cindy has over three decades of healthcare industry experience within national managed care organizations, health insurers, ACOs, physician IPAs, and hospital systems. Um, Cindy is a subject matter expert in payer provider relationships, negotiations, alliances, provider risk and incentive reimbursement models, alignment of provider reimbursement models with benefit design, um, and uh, fund flow models for commercial self-insured, Medicare Advantaged, and Medicare, excuse me, Medicaid Managed Care products. Also joining us today um, will be Lori Daigle. Uh, Lori is a uh, member of our Stroudwater Revenue Cycle Solutions team. She has over 20 years experience in medical insurance, uh, claim processing, medical billing, software training, and healthcare financial management. Uh, Lori has extensive experience with medical claim review, auditing, small group practice, large academic institutions, and hospitals of all sizes in between. She's been instrumental in creating um, revenue integrity resources to unify coding, billing, compliance concerns for um, total and inclusive revenue cycle oversight. Also joining us today is Lori Beaudry. Um, Lori also brings a wealth of experience, 30 years experience working in the healthcare industry. She's the Vice President of Clinical Financial Resources Incorporated, which provides services to hospitals as well as physician groups in the area of medical coding, professional billing, case management, and clinical documentation improvement. Lori has a 15-year working relationship with uh, John Bain and Lori Daigle of Stridewater Revenue Cycle Solutions, and uh, we're pleased to have her as part of our uh, faculty today. With that, I'd like to turn things over to John Bain. Uh, John, um, the con is yours. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, appreciate you um, uh, introducing everybody. Um, I'd like to take a couple of seconds and just welcome everybody and tell you how appreciative we are uh, that you are uh, spending a couple of minutes with us today uh, and really going over some issues that 
uh, are really unprecedented. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, there's lots of different ways that we look at uh, revenue cycle issues and crises that come around. And usually they are um, due to a specific reason and it's something that we can attack and figure out. What we're kind of undergoing right now is if you can imagine, we're getting hit from every single potential side in addition to all of the, the clinical concerns that are out there. So what we wanted to try to do today is to come up with some, some conversations for you that would allow you to uh, take action, that would allow you to uh, maybe uh, de-stress a little bit about certain aspects of your operation and have very concrete conversations that will allow your revenue cycle to serve and to leverage and enhance the wonderful clinical work that your, your clinicians are doing. We want to make sure that the, the revenue cycle is there to perform in an excellent manner and is one that will allow uh, the, the clinicians and your technicians and, and all of the wonderful people in the hospital who are, who are handling all of these, these strains from a, from a consumer standpoint that really, you know, enhance that. So what we wanted to try to do is we're going to go through and we're going to give you some sections along the way here and we're going to introduce you to some concepts and hopefully to maybe allow you to think a little bit differently, uh, think a little bit entrepreneurially. Um, but most importantly, uh, focus it so that this is the time where we want everyone in your hospital to come together, to be one, to, uh, if we've got a cultural issue historically where we've got a, a, a revenue cycle where it's an us versus them, uh, or we've got people who have always walked around saying, hey, you know, we do it this way because it's the way we've always done it. Well, this has never happened before. This is the perfect time to put an interruption into that process and really stop it and then start talking in terms of us and we rather than them and you. So um, with that, um, what we're gonna try to do today is we wanna talk to you about the importance of implementing uh, important revenue cycle management controls. You know, what do we focus on? How are we looking at things? Uh, you know, we want to detail the importance of having a central committee that can help make sense of things, and most importantly, prioritize actions, prioritize next steps, and make sure that communication is solid. We want to understand, you know, outpatient and inpatient coding best practices. There's a lot of stuff that's changing on us. The, the earth is shifting under our feet like never before. It is incumbent that we understand that that's happening and we're empowering the people within our revenue cycle to address issues as they arise. We want to review the role and revenue cycle components of telehealth and implement controls to manage business office practices. Lots and lots of questions surrounding uh, the differences between telemedicine and telehealth. And we seem to be using uh, some words interchangeably when really we shouldn't. So we're going to go through all of that and making sure that your business office staff has the support they need to really get what they need to, um, to get done. Um, very importantly, too, we want to talk about, you know, strategies to engage with your payers. You guys are all in the same boat now. I mean, so this is one system. This is one group. So this isn't, you know, a negotiation process or anything. This is trying to make sure that everybody is on the same page and is doing things in the same manner and pulling in the same direction. And then most importantly as well, we want to understand we have a lot of people who are working remotely right now. And historically, we've just never done that. So there's a different skill set that goes into that. So as we, as an industry, you know, gear up to face this crisis, the hospitals must ensure that their revenue cycle is up to the challenge. Okay, the incorporation of remote staffing, volume variability, uh, payer mix changes, and impeded cash flow, you know, have the potential absolutely to challenge the financial vi viability of every organization, whether it's big, small, it makes no difference. The revenue cycle has to be primed to provide timely, consistent information to allow leadership to manage and anticipate those cash flow and customer concerns. And one thing that we're going to talk throughout the presentation as well is we cannot forget and, but that our revenue cycle, we must look at the revenue cycle through the patient's eyes. The steps that we're taking, we need to be sure that we're ready. You know, even though volumes are falling, we know that at some point this is going to end and we're going to have an influx of people that are going to come in and try to reschedule or going to have billing concerns around testing or whatever it might be. We as a revenue cycle need to make the process simple, 
easy to understand and make it so that our access is good for people. So we got to keep our, our eye on the ball with that. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to go through also is in, in chat about, you know, what components do you need to keep uh, a tr track of, you know, whether it be through a dashboard or a daily listing. So when you have a meeting, we're not trying to look at everything. We're trying to look at the things that we've identified as an administrative priority. So we're going to go through some of that stuff. And we also want to really talk about how the, the team needs to look at telehealth and take the steps that are necessary to ensure success with that. So ultimately, the goal of this presentation is to ensure that the revenue cycle supports and enhances the clinical support each hospital provides its patients and community. That's the role of our revenue cycle. We're not here to replace clinicians. We're not here to, to, to do anything around outside of them. We're there to leverage and make it so that they can provide the support and care that the communities need. So with that in mind, let's, let's start moving forward. So what are we hearing from the field? Um, this has been unprecedented in the amount of different types of conversations that we're hearing from uh, people of all different sizes and shapes and forms from hospitals, the, the smallest hospital to the, the biggest academic hospitals. What we're seeing is that, you know, uh, initially you had this huge flux where everyone listened and said, you know what, stay away from the ER. So what did everybody do? They stayed away from the ER. So all of a sudden, all of your urgent care, your lower level acuity people started staying home. They also didn't bother to go to the doctor. So they started calling and trying to get some information over the telephone, thus the importance now of telehealth, right? Then they started getting more information out to people about what the symptoms might be. And then we start seeing people who believe that they might have the virus, again, ahead of some of the testing components. Now they start showing up at our ER and there's just this huge variability in flux. Likewise, in the last 48 hours, you've seen uh, national organizations, whether it's the Academy of Surgeons or the, the Dental Association, um, all of which have supported the CMS logic of ending and postponing all elective surgical and dental procedures. So you've got what has historically been something that has been a, a, a foundational element of our hospital, which is our operative services, you know, our ORs are now empty. So what does that do? How does that you know, impact us moving forward from a, a, from a cash flow standpoint? Um, you know, we've also got this huge uh, drop off of physician visits that are coming through. So all of the ancillary orders that we would normally get, whether it be for CT or MRI or labs, they've just fallen right off the, the face of the earth here. So what we need to do is in each one of the hospitals, you probably have a, a very, real central committee right now that's handing, handling all of the clinical concerns and they're meeting on a daily basis and they're setting out the, the course of the day. So, you know, it's like almost like an expanded daily huddle in, that, in, in your hospital, but now we've got more people that are involved in it. What we think you really also need to do is you need to carve out consistent time every day to have the people who are running your business, running the revenue cycle, get together and make sure that we're communicating and we're getting on the same page and we're addressing the issues that we need to address. So we understand the revenue cycle just doesn't have to perform well. It's got to perform exceptionally to make sure that we protect the viability of the organization. So we need to make sure that we have some type of daily revenue cycle management that has to be incorporated through the establishment and really through what we think is a revenue cycle steering committee. And it's a group of folks who get together and at a minimum, it needs to include the CEO, the CFO, your revenue cycle director, your business office manager, your emergency room director, radiology, lab, and physician practice manager. In addition to that, you want to make sure that you've got, whether you've got an HIM director, if you've got professional coders, you get them in the room. You want to have a multidisciplinary group together that has the representation of your entire revenue cycle. And again, this needs to be done in a separate fashion, in a separate manner than your clinical team. It's got to be separate and distinct. The revenue cycle steering meetings need to, should last at least one hour and they should be scheduled daily and at the same time each day. Because what you'll find is as you start having these conversations, people are going to go and they're gonna have homework assignments that they're gonna to have to have enough time to be able to bring the answers back. And you wanna give them the ability to work their schedule around making sure that they hold up their end of the bargain, okay? The revenue cycle steering committee meetings need to be agenda driven. This has gotta be an administrative priority and it's gotta go through and reflect the components that the group as a whole thinks are important to manage our revenue cycle. 
So in, in some of these areas, you know, we may say we want to review the, you know, scheduled outpatient visits. Maybe you're still getting people that are coming through the hospital on an outpatient visit. Let's take a moment to look at those and measure those. If we've got the ability to use Q1 to date, so we've got January, February, and March year to date numbers, get those available so we can see what the drop off is. Likewise, if we can look at what March or in April was of 2019, so that we can see where things are in reflection to that, that's hugely important. Because as you start going and looking at all of the things we're talking about here, eventually you're gonna have to figure out when are we back at steady state and what does that mean? So we don't wanna be talking theory, we wanna talk specific data components and we wanna talk practically. You know, we wanna track our emergency room volume. We wanna track what kind of patients are coming through. We want to identify what our census is, what is on the inpatient side, what is on the observation side, and what patients are coming through that are, uh, you know, potential exposure to COVID and which ones are coming through because they're just generally sick with some other illness, right? We want to make sure that we understand what our claim submission volume is. Most hospitals never look and manage the size of the files that we send out. And historically, we may not even know. We need to figure out what our normal daily sub, uh, distribution is for Medicare and our commercial payers so that we can track that as it goes down. And then as it starts to rebound, we know when we start getting back to steady state. We need to look at our cash receipts and realize we're getting paid today for activity that happened 15, 30, 35, 50 days ago. Well, when do you start running into a, uh, the, the problem where we're going to run out of cash because now our volume is interrupting the cash flow? We got to look at late charges, most expensive component of our revenue cycle. So late charges are when revenue hits the bill after it left. We need to make sure that no bills leave without all revenue being recognized. We need to look and talk about, from a coding perspective, are our physicians working and making sure that the charts that they're completing are finalized so coding can do their job. We've got clearinghouse issues. If we, we don't know what our success rate is from getting claims out cleanly to the payers, anything less than 95% is an issue. You need to make sure that you're working excellently. You're not trying to survive here. You're working to make sure that you're getting things out clean and allowing the payers to adjudicate them promptly and timely. Okay. What are we doing from an AR management standpoint? You know, how do we look at it? Do we get reports that separate it out by payer, by self-pay? What's our process going forward with this? You know, do we have scheduling concerns? You know, a lot of people, you know, we are scheduling sometimes as an area of frustration. Are we ready to make it so that when our patients start calling and asking questions, are we giving them consistent answers? So ultimately, when we start looking at all of these things combined, our revenue cycle is only good as the data that we get. And it's dependent on accurate and timely metrics, okay? So we need to make sure that when we pull these things off and create sort of our dashboard, which aligns directly with what we set as our priorities, that we have a central repository that the group, when they get together, can review exactly what's happening. There's no confusion. And we can make sure that there is uh, clear communication across the board. Now, I want to take two seconds. You know, Lori Daigle, you know, we've been involved in a lot of these types of things, um, you know, from revenue cycle crises, uh, you know, certainly not to this level. Uh, but just as you look at what, what are a couple of components that are critical in your eye from a revenue cycle director standpoint or a uh, business office manager that need to be part of those, those dashboard reports? Well, other than the things you've already mentioned, you know, we want to take a look at claim volume um, and rejections. So how many claims um, were entered into the system and how many did your clearinghouse reject? You're gonna be hitting a lot of unlisted codes now that maybe weren't um, issues before because we don't have a lot of the codes that we need for this COVID virus right now. So you, you might be hitting things like that. You may be hitting um, authorization requirements even though they've been waived because the payer adjudicators may not be catching up with with their decisions that they're making. So you wanna be looking at um, claims that are rejecting, claims that are passing, claims on hold, and try to make sure that you can get all of that moving forward. 
No, that not, that makes a lot lot of sense. And and Lori Beaudry, um, you know, from a if I'm putting my HIM director hat on, or I'm looking at it through the the eyes of a professional coder, um, you know, this type of meeting makes it much easier, I believe, for you to talk to and address documentation issues, um, making sure that that charts are are, are being completed on a timely fashion. Um, this gives you a better vehicle to, to be a better advocate for your coders and uh, getting your jobs uh, done on a daily basis, correct? Correct, particularly with the volumes, making sure that the coders are understanding there will be a decrease in volumes for outpatient, but you're going to see an increase in inpatient and observation and making sure that everybody understands the coders are gonna to need to work directly with the physicians and as busy as all of the clinical staff is, we still need to get bills out the door, so we still are going to need some really detailed documentation from the providers regarding the COVID virus, making sure that they've documented whether the patient is suspected, whether they've sent a test out, just making sure that the documentation is there to help the coders. And, and I think as well, you know, being a part of this meeting and then having, you know, the CEO and CFO to be a participant in it and, you know, and to allow them to help you uh, get the information that you need, um, you know, becomes, you know, really paramount. Correct. I fully agree. And when you have the backup of the CFO and he's able to work with the clinical directors, whether it's the clinical nurses, director nurses, or whether it's the physicians that are in charge of the particular group, whether it be hospitalists or ERs, or intensivists, it's really important that they understand coding isn't just trying to give them more work. Yeah, yeah. So, and I and I think this is so the the collective intelligence of the group grows every time there's a meeting. Every time people understand, we look at things through uh, other people's perspectives, and all of a sudden we start to have an empathy over what we need to do to get things done. And this revenue cycle steering committee, and, we're, and you'll hear more about this as we talk about through the the different issues, uh, you know, that's going to follow in a couple of minutes here. This is the place where you can make sure that you're working on the right issues, that you're managing the staff appropriately, that you are talking to your external partners with the, the same voice. This is a critical component, and, and this is correcting what a lot of revenue cycles you know, lack, which is the one brain, the one mentality, the one mission. Rather than having 15 different you know, areas working individually, now we pull those together and we're all working towards a, a common goal. So I, I encourage you guys to, to, to put something similar to this, regardless of the size of the hospital, Understanding it in the smaller hospitals, it might be a small group because you're all wearing 37 hats. I get it, but this the communication is going to be incredibly important moving forward. And one of the things that we, you know, and, and the, Lori did a great job a, a minute ago, you know, understanding that from a coding perspective, you know, uh, things are changing. And I don't think, you know, administratively and throughout the entire revenue cycle, people don't understand what each other does. And that is really specifically and, and particularly due to, to what coding does. Because um, coding sort of is this black box that no one really understands what the heck they do. But now everything that is going to be an output is really dependent upon how well our coders and how well we understand the services that we're, we're providing here, especially since we're getting remote staffing. Um, that we may have insufficient remote technology to make it so that people can do things as fast as they have historically done. Um, you know, we may have, Maury mentioned this a minute ago, we've got a shift. We don't have as much outpatient. Now we've got more inpatient. Do our outpatient coders have the ability to work in the terminology of inpatients? You know, do we understand telehealth? I mean, are we using, you know, the right codes? Are we having the right conversations? And, and what we want to make sure of is that and we want to spend some time here and, and specifically work through uh, what we like to call telemedicine and try to understand the different components that are applicable uh, to you and your staff. And Lori uh, Daigle, I'd like you to, if you could, could you walk through a little bit of this stuff with us and, and give us the, the up to the minute uh, thought process on, on where we stand with, with this, this uh, crazy thing called telemedicine and telehealth? Sure, because it is it is changing rapidly, um, and and as discussions are out there, and and um, you know, doc, uh, people are making edicts and, and providing things. We have to understand there is a difference between what we think of as telemedicine and what is being 
um, relax, which are the guidelines around telehealth. So some of these things that patients really aren't going to understand the difference between the two. But we also have to understand guidance is changing rapidly. I know Lori and I were back and forth this morning because things are even changing today about some of the, um, the things that we have to be considered, considered with coding and billing and things like that. So really be checking every single day. Be looking at the CDC websites, the CMS websites. Check the newsroom in um, CMS. Look at the FAQs for current interpretations of some of the things that are being said because information is being shared, but it's not necessarily being interpreted correctly. <clears throat> so when we think telemedicine versus telehealth, we have, there's lots of codes available for telemedicine, but telehealth is really what we're talking about a lot. And that refers to the services with interactive technology, some sort of face-to-face -face internet connection, whether it's through people's computers or their phones. It used to be interactive technology at facilities or practices. That's what has been relaxed. So now patients can initiate them from their own home. We don't have to have so much what we used to call the originating site. They can actually originate it from their own homes and communicate with what we call a distant site, which is where the specialist or practitioner is sitting. Telephone visits have to be initiated by the patient and there is a separate code set. Medicare guidelines have not been expanded for telephone visits, just for the telehealth visits. We also have guidelines around remote visits, which are more internet-based information, and then what we call virtual check-ins, those quick, quick visits. These are all different things. So looking at um, what the originating site, if you have the patient in your facility, you can build this code Q3014. And this has been relaxed a little bit about the kind of um, organizations that can build this. You no longer have to be rural if the patient is in your facility. You can still build this code. And Medicare has signaled that they won't be auditing for the place of service of the originating site. So they're not going to be looking to see if you're in the right place. They've also said it can be in the patient's home. And as um, emergencies are being um, announced state by state, that will include Advantage plans as well. So be checking with your Advantage plans and see what their guidance is as things expand. The waiver on the federal government applies to federal uh, requirements, not state requirements. So also be looking at your state guidelines, what your state Medicaid is doing. The codes that we um, will be looking at and the practitioners that are included for the actual practitioners that we consider um, doctors, MDs, DOs, NPs, and PAs, those are what the telehealth codes are for. Um, there's other practitioners also that are included, but I put a link at the bottom so that um, in the interest of time, we could move through these. If we're talking about a patient in an ED or an initial inpatient, we would use the code set G0425 through G0427. For initial critical care, the practitioner doing the telehealth visit would use G0508. For subsequent inpatient and skilled nursing, we're going to use the G0406 through 48, 408. And then for outpatient and office type services, and this would be the codes you use if the patient is at home, you're going to use the regular outpatient office codes, 99201 to 99215. Pharmacy management has its own code too, so we want to make sure if that's the service that's being performed, that is considered included in these telehealth codes. We have billing requirements around this, and these are really payer specific. Medicare is looking for the GQ modifier. Everybody is looking for place of service O2. GQ modifier synchronizes that asynchronous technology. That means some sort of face-to-face -face capability. Um, commercial payers might want the AMA modifier, which is 95, so we'll be looking at that too. Unfortunately, when the guidelines expanded, they did not include FQHC and RHCs. So they cannot serve as distant sites. They can't be the provider talking to their patient on their phone and get paid for the visit. They only have this one code available to them. And this is that um, G0071. It's meant to be for a brief visit, five minutes or more. Unfortunately, this is the only code that's available. And it's for any payment for communication technology-based service. So whether it's through your phone or through the internet, a, you know, a verbal question um, through the internet or face-to-face, -face, this is the only code FQHCs and RHCs get to use. 
Telephone visits, um, there are guidelines around these codes. Unfortunately, Medicare guidelines have not expanded to accept the telephone visits. Once the uh, emergency waiver, the 1135 emergency waiver went into place, states could start making their own guidelines as well. So states have the authority for Medicaid to start accepting telephone visits. And you want to reach out and find out um, if your state is doing that. If not, get them started on what we call that appendix K, appendix K waiver and make sure that they try to include this. If you're doing telephone visits, they have to be initiated by the patient. They have to be unrelated to surgeries or visits within the previous seven days and not result in a visit within the next 24 hours or the next available appointment. Those two really aren't going to be a great concern for this particular crisis. Patients should always be aware they're being charged if they're making a phone call. In the case of the phone visits, these are time-based services. So all of those other guidelines apply, and then you would base it on the time. So the code set is 99441 through 443. And it's based on the amount of time you spend with the patient on the phone. Um, if, when the guidelines say for, for um, physicians versus other qualified practitioners, that code set is for MDs, DOs, NPs, PAs, that type of practitioner that we usually consider um, doctors or non non-doctor practitioners, NPPs. Um, there is another set of codes for other providers. Now we have speech therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists having to work with their patients remotely as well. So they would use this code set. These are also time-based with the same timings, but they're for the, this type of practitioner. This code is 98966 through 98968. All, again, all the other guidelines apply as well in terms of has to be initiated um, by the patient and not result in a visit within the next few days, et cetera. Um, when we talk about the online visit codes, this code set 99421 through 99423 is also time-based. And this isn't necessarily the face-to-face um, -face visit online. It's, it can be any other electronic platform. So it can be emails. It can be information sent from your phone, your heart rates and, um, you know, blood pressure and things like that, information going back and forth. These are the code sets you would use for that. Again, um, for those code sets as well, we have another scenario for non-professional practitioners, for um, ones that we wouldn't consider doctor's visits. And they would use this code set. For Again, you might have those same kinds of questions coming for physical therapy, occupational therapy, et cetera. In that case, they do have codes available for CPT. These would be the codes that your um, commercial payers may be looking for. 98970 through 98972. Again, these are time-based. Check with your payer requirements on these. These are changing rapidly. For your government payers, Medicare does not like to use the word evaluation for anybody other than physician practitioners. They want to use the word assessment. And so they don't like the description assigned to the CPTs. They created HCPCS. Codes are very, very similar um, to the guidelines for the CPTs. They've just changed that one word from evaluation to assessment. But otherwise, they're the same. I, we get have this brief communication technology that is available to these non-RHCs and FQHCs. This is the G0, G2012, and this would be a five to ten minute just doctor checking with the patient to make sure that things are going as planned and that, um, you know, you might not have the opportunity to check with your patient normally. This is, can be an email to the patient or an interaction back and forth with the patient that way. No, Laurie, that's that's, that's great stuff. Uh, so, so Lori, Lori Beaudry, um, just a quick question. You're talking to providers and hospitals across the country. Uh, are you getting uh, from their questions that there's still a great deal of confusion on how to use these codes and whether they should be using these codes? Yes, I, I think a lot of the facilities are having an issue with whether or not the hospital can bill for these services that are being provided by these practitioners. Um, and as Laurie Daigle and I are looking at everything and looking at what CMS has come out in their facts, they're saying that the originating site is now the physician's home, 
it's not a hospital and therefore the hospital cannot bill as the originating site. So it's been very difficult. They're losing revenue when you have a hospital-based clinic and now they're not able to bill anything, but the physicians are still at the hospital talking to the patients, choosing one of these telemedicine options. So it's been very difficult for them to figure out all of the specific requirements. And as Laurie said, they change day by day. We're trying to keep up with them. It's a payer by payer. And the federal government is coming up with something different than the states and something different than the commercial payers. So, so Lori Daigle, given that, um, so if we needed to uh, have, uh, you know, the people who are listening today uh, take the section that you just presented and they come back to, and I think the vehicle of the Revenue Steering Committee is, is perfect for this, uh, if I am coding in business managers uh, and I bring this to the group, what, how, how do they go forward here? How do they, you know, start that conversation to, to select the right codes and, and what do we have them do from a, a, a charge master and a billing standpoint? Right. So, so as Lori had said, critical access hospitals, provider-based practices can now be the distant site. They can be the one on the phone talking to the patient, but there is no facility component to that. So you would build a professional service only. So when you're tracking, tracking those services, it would be really important from a billing perspective, if your system automatically split bills, you have to turn that off for these services. There is no facility component for those services. It's professional only, and you don't get to build the originating site visit because the patient isn't with you at all. So that would be one thing that you have to make sure that you check on and build that appropriately. And, and from a, a charge master standpoint, um, you know, they are clearly, and I think it's you know, very important uh, that they're going to be looking at it and trying to establish from a professional uh, fee standpoint. And let me just ask you, so if, if they're sitting around the room and trying to figure out which of these codes uh, might be applicable, so you may have, you know, say the, the rehabilitation services folks who raise their hand and say, well, wait a minute, I didn't know we could do X, Y, or Z. Do you have suggestions for people who may have never used or touched these types of codes in the past? How do they go and research and understand whether not only if they were applicable for them, but you know how they should use them, uh, given maybe that the coders are equally confused about it. Right. Um, so the the uh, you, luckily organizations like the APTA, the therapist organizations usually have a really good handle on this. And if you go to their home pages, they do a good job of explaining how you can use this. The business offices also now are going to have to take that opportunity to reach out to these types of providers and practitioners to make sure they understand what's available to them. When we start talking about the business office, we're going to talk about um, increased responsibilities that will be falling on the business office now to stay abreast of all this. And one of them will be communicating with the different types of providers in the organization to make sure they're aware of um, these changes in the services they can be providing. Yeah, and I, and I think truer words have never been said that this is not something that can be done by someone by themselves. This is something that the group has to get together and make sure that they're doing things appropriately and uh, effectively for um, the hospital and the physician practices. So, uh, so thank you, Lori, uh, for that. Um, and, and this is a natural transition as we start talking about um, you know, where our coders are standing right now and maybe you know, for the first time in their lives they are, are working on uh, services and cases that they've never done before. Um, it becomes, I think, really important for everybody to have a, a reset and understand what our coders are trying to do, what support administratively we need to provide them, what resources need to be available, and, and also understand that there's got to be a way for us to talk some of the language and understand, you know, and, and help the coders move forward. So, Lori, uh, Baudry, uh, if you could, please, could you just kind of help us understand some of the, the important pieces here that, uh, that your coders are working through and the considerations that if I'm part of this revenue cycle steering committee that I, I just need to have in the back of my mind as, as we move forward during this crisis? Sure. So we'll get into the specifics about coding for the COVID-19, but what really needs to be understood is that the coders themselves their guidelines have not changed. They still need to code certain conditions that are, have underlying etiology. 
They still have to follow, follow the sequencing of an underlying condition first and the manifestation second. They still need to follow the guidelines and diseases classified elsewhere. They still need to follow the excludes one. They need to follow the excludes two. They need to follow the use and addition code and sequencing. That has not changed and that will remain the same. So it'll be difficult as we move forward with the coders coding the inpatient and then coding the observation, making sure that all of these rules are followed and making sure that they've captured the COVID and all of the comorbidities that go with it. So that brings us into the outpatient and the inpatient. There's been a lot of discussion about the presumptive diagnosis. You've had the president keep saying we have presumptive cases. You see it on the news, presumptive cases. And there is two coding guidelines for this. The patient is coding an outpatient. So we're talking about radiology, we're talking about ED, we're talking about observation cases. And it's very important that they understand that observation is an outpatient service and it needs to follow the outpatient coding guidelines which tells the coders they cannot capture presumptive, suspected, presumed, or ruled out. They cannot code any of those diagnoses. In those cases, they'll need to code the symptoms followed by the Z code saying that the patient was exposed and they are keeping an eye on them. This differs very, very from the inpatient. Inpatient can code possible. They can code all of those diagnoses. They're going to be coding COVID. They're going to be coding pneumonia. They're going to be coding all of those instances. They have very different guidelines, and theirs is that chiefly responsible for their patient's admission is their primary diagnosis. So it's a very different, they code everything, if probable, suspected, all of those items are coded on an inpatient basis. They have to be very careful about what they pick as a principal diagnosis. Um, if there are two principal diagnoses, then it's the one chiefly responsible, the one that had treatment, and the one that was the circumstances of the admission. So it's very important that they understand the difference between the inpatient and the outpatient coding. They need so, to, so to put it medical record. To put it into yeah, so yeah. to put it into layman's terms and just just help me because I, I always get a little bit confused on this as well. <laughs> so sure. from from the outpatient side, we're, we're talking about you know what it was upon arrival not subsequent to all of the testing and everything that has gone through versus on the inpatient side, there's more leeway about what you might have. Correct. And, and to clarify on the outpatient side, it is the diagnosis known at the time of the patient's discharge. So they're not going to know if they're COVID-19 positive. They're not going to know if they have that because the test is being sent off. So in that case, it's going to be a Z code. If the patient is in house and the test comes back, they're going to know that they're already positive. And that's where the difference between the two different types of coding comes in. Okay. And that's, that's usually why you have a coder that specializes in outpatient and a coder mm -hmm. that specializes in inpatient. And now the all the lines are getting gray. A a absolutely. So just before we, we move on to the, the COVID specific stuff, so do we have, um, do you have suggestions for coders who maybe have always worked on one side of the aisle and all of a sudden now are are blending into you know the inpatient side because you know and I don't think people appreciate there there really is very different thought processes and terminologies even beyond what you've kind of uh, gone through here but just in their practice patterns and how they look at things you know what would you suggest if if I've got an outpatient coder who has historically done you know emergency room stuff and is now going to fill in and help us do our inpatient you know what what should they be thinking of you know what what different resources should they be trying to reach out and grab well uh, the most important thing i think is if you're assigning a coder um to code inpatient but they have not coded it you want to give them what we call the simple visits and those are the people that have been in there for less than three days those are the moms and babies as we refer to them because the coding guidelines for them are very straightforward it gives them the opportunity to code a record that they hadn't coded before leaving the more experienced inpatient coders to take care of the sicker patients the ones that are in the icu or dealing with the covid and that's the first recommendation that i make the second recommendation I'm, that i make if you're putting an outpatient coder who knows the codes they know all of them they've been coding them it's really the guidelines that they have to learn and that is making sure that they use all of the coding clinics that they read it that they understand what the coding clinics are out there for particularly when assigning the primary diagnosis uh, that that's that's great thank you for that clarification 
So we're going to talk about the guidance of the definitive diagnosis of corona, I'll call it COVID-19. As we put this together, these were the guidelines that were set by the CDC, and this is the information that they provided to us on February 20th. They have come out on March 18th and changed the guidelines, and that will be effective April 1st. And those, all of that information is available on the CDC website. And I'll get into that a little bit. I know it's not part of the presentation, but I do want to touch on it because as of right now, for any dates of service through March 31st, you will be following these particular go guidelines. They have, we have a specific for pneumonia, we have a specific for acute bronchitis, we have a specific to bronchitis not specified. Along with those codes, as a secondary code, we're going to code B9729, and that says other corona as a cause of disease. The reason they're using the other corona is that they did not have one specific to corona 19. They've only had them for corona 1 through 18. So now the corona 19 is very specific, which is why we're using other through March 31st. I want to be clear about that. We also have codes for lower respiratory, for respiratory infection, and acute distress. Again, the secondary code for all of those is B9729. You will use the primary diagnosis of with it. As I say to, to the coders, where is the location of the infection? And then what is the organism of the infection? And I think it makes it easier for people to understand when we say primary versus secondary code. We have suspected COVID exposure. This is very common for the outpatient. And this is actually fairly common right now. There are patients that are in-house. If you're coding for a professional hospitalist or you're coding for a professional intensivist or a professional primary care, or infectious disease. As of right now, they may not know that the patient has COVID, so their daily visits are gonna be Z20828, the same as the ED if the patient comes in and they're tested. You're gonna to want to make sure that the coders are using the Z20828. We need to make sure that the insurance company know why they were seen, if there's gonna be any write-offs for them, if there's any waived deductibles or co-payments, it's important that the coders understand that they must use one of those codes. For an outpatient, they'll be using the signs and symptoms, a cough, shortness of breath, a fever, along with the Z20A28. Inpatient, again, is very different. Um, the B342, as I said before, it was a coronavirus infection, unspecified. We're not going to use that because the, the corona 19, the COVID-19 is respiratory in nature, and therefore the B29, 9729 is more applicable to this particular case. We also want to make sure, and this is when we work with the physicians, to make sure that we know that the patient has a history of immunosuppressive therapy. Um, I've been working with some physicians and they've been very good about documenting when the patient is in-house. It is important that we let the insurance company know why they're in-house, why they've been admitted. That's one of the reasons that they needed to keep them in-house and not send them home. I do want to touch a little bit on the new code, which is U07.1. It is brand new. It is effective April 1st. It is the very first time that the World Health Organization has worked with the CDC and that they have come out with a new code prior to October 1st. This is completely unprecedented. I have never seen it in the 30 years I've been doing it, and I don't think that has ever happened. It's a U code because the U codes are used for the new diseases of uncertain etiology or an emergency use. Right now, they are saying that the U code is only to be used as a primary code. It is never to use, be used secondary. They want you to use U071, and they want you to identify the location of the infection. Is it pneumonia? Is it lower respiratory? Is it upper respiratory? Is it acute? Is it bronchitis? It also excludes B342, which means you cannot code here. Um, those Guidelines are available on the CDC and they were just published. So I do suggest that everybody goes on the CDC website, pull it, make sure the coders are aware of it, but more importantly, make sure that your software companies are aware of it. I know that 3M is aware of it. If you're using another encoder, or if you're using another computer system, you need to make sure that your computers are ready, that everything has been loaded in order for the hospitals to use the U07.1. And, and so that really, you know, so that just shows you how, what, how it, much of a different time this is, you know, for you to be able to say that you've never seen this um, in, in your career, uh, you know, just speaks to the fact that communication becomes so important and having a revenue cycle 
that is engaged and you've got, uh, you know, the ability to let everyone in the hospital know that this is happening um, because now is the time, like you just mentioned, to talk to your abstracting, your, your billing software people to make sure that you've got the availability of that code. And, and what compounds things, I think, even more is the fact that, you know, historically you've had you know, all of your coders kind of, you know, shoulder to shoulder and can and can deal with the burden collectively, uh, you know, as a group in the same room. Now that's just not the case. And now we've got our coders working from home. Um, and, and I know that you, you've got a tremendous amount of experience managing remote staff. And I wanted you to take some time here just to kind of, you know, help us understand the challenges and the strategies that are available to us to make sure that we're we're putting our coders in the best situation to succeed, but also, you know, giving them the support so that we can make sure that the production stays as where it is. So can you help us out a little bit with that as well? Sure. As you know, I, I'm very experienced with the remote world. I personally have been working remotely for 27 of my 30 years, so I probably was one of the first people that ever did it. Um, you need to have a home computer. Your home computer needs to be password protected. That is probably the most important thing that I can tell you. I tell my coders or any coder that I deal with that's going um, remote or even the business office, nobody else should be touching that computer. Nobody else should be on it. It should be password protected. You need to have your own computer for that instance. If you're going to get up because you need to go get a drink or you're going to take a break, you need to stretch your legs, you need to make sure that you've logged off the hospital site. You never minimize it. You always log off before you log on. Same HIPAA rules apply. You Almost more, you need to be more conscious of them. Um, what I do have is the coder sign on first thing in the morning. I'm starting my day. It, it's the only way. You can't see them, so you can't tell if they came into the office and said good morning. Um, usually they say, good morning, I've, I've started my day. Um, the coders will will have their assignments. Usually their supervisors will assign them work lists or work queues and, or say, you're going to be coding data service such and such. What we do is if they have multiple, we let them email us at the end of the task. That way we can keep on and know if their production is meeting what we need to have under the production. We have them email us when they take a break. So if they're going to take their more afternoon break, we have them email us. We have them email us when they're returning, taking their lunch or returning from lunch. It sounds like you're that you're micromanaging them, and I know that some of them feel that way, but it is a remote world and you can't see them. So the only form of communication is through email. So it's very important that they understand you're not just trying to micromanage them. You're paying them for an eight-hour day, so you're still going to expect eight hours worth of work. Again, code to sign off at the end of the day. I'm all set with my assignment. Have a great day. And that's and we usually email them back. Same to you. Verifying that the email is secure. If you're not on a remote desktop, if you're just on email, you need to make sure that you're sending secure emails uh, to send any questions or to respond to any questions that contain PHI. It's still important, even though we're remote, that we still follow the HIPAA guidelines. The using a product such as GoToMeeting, there's a million different um, ways to use it. Uh, we just put GoToMeeting in it because it's one of the most common. Um, actually, one of the vendors that we know just put out that they're offering anybody that uses their service a free year of their webinar because they know that so many people are going remote, allowing you to actually video with a coder. Some coders don't do well not being able to be face-to-face, -face, so if you need to have audio with them to go through, then I suggest that you do that, but constant email throughout the day. These new guidelines that have come out, I, I would suggest that you have a conference call with the coders, make sure that they all understand what the new guidelines are for the new code, that they understand how to use them. Follow it up with an email so they have it in writing from you so that they understand it. it coders get a little bit more shy when they're remote. They're afraid to ask a question because now it's in writing. So just give them some flexibility and let them know that you can answer any question that you want and that there is no question that shouldn't be asked. So, so communicate, communicate, communicate. Communicate. You got it. Same thing with the business offices. I know the business offices are going to be going remote as well. Communicate, communicate, communicate. HIPAA compliantly, That's, communicate. 
Yeah, that, 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 no, that's great stuff. That's great stuff. Um, hey, uh, so just to take a second here too, Laurie Daigle, uh, I know that you've been doing a lot of uh, research on uh, some new lab tests that are coming through and available CPT and HICPIT codes. Can you take two seconds and try to help everybody understand um, how these things might be used and you know how they should set them up in their, their charge master if they are providing service? Sure. Just as Lori mentioned, um, with how quickly the ICD codes are evolving, the CPTs and HITPICs pretty much did as well. So AMA came out with a, a CPT to recognize the lab test that's associated with it, and that's 87635. The description of the lab test for a CPT and HICPIC are the same. There's just a few other minor changes. Now, the other thing AMA comes out with is what they call the descriptions. They have a short description, a medium description, and a long description. For uniformity and so that everybody understands exactly what's going on, I always um, suggest that the charge masters, if you have enough room in your charge master, use the AMA medium description. It's usually up to about 45 to 48 characters. And it says everything you need to know about the code, and it distinguishes the code from anything else in the same range of codes. Especially when we have a new code like this that kind of had to squeeze into a code set, we want to make sure that it understands it completely. So what I've had, what I've put in here is the CDM description that the AMA designed as the medium description. Now, Medicare wanted to make a distinction between the code developed by the CDC lab testing and lab tests performed elsewhere and some of the other um, techniques. So they set up two codes, U0001, which is the CDC lab testing, and then U0002, which is every other lab testing. They set the fees for the CDC test at $36, and the Medicare reimbursement for um, the every other lab testing is $51. I would recommend using or, or basing your description in the charge master on the description set up by the AMA, but just adding it to it. So truncating a little bit, for the CDC test, you would use a description saying CDC amplified probe technique. And likewise, for the non-CDC, say non-CDC amplified probe technique. The technique is the same, the test um, setup is different. So you wanna distinguish between the two of those. Um, you also wanna you know, kind of understand when you're sending your test out, which pays you are, you're using, and set up your charge master appropriately. So do you need to set this up as an alternate code? If you're sending it to, uh, let's say if your payer is Blue Cross, do they want the CPT? And so you'd set your alternate code to the CPT or will they accept the HICPIC? Since HICPIC is the more specific in this case, you want that to be the primary code because for either one, the CPT is the same. So the CPT can be your alternate code payer specific. And the revenue code associated with these should be 302. That's the immunology for infectious diseases revenue code. So you would set that for your revenue code every time. Okay. Now, now that's, that's, that's great stuff. And this is actually a perfect segue as we start moving into some payer considerations because I think people looking at this screen will notice that there is no fee right now uh, under the 87635 uh, because that really is based on what the commercial payers are going to reimburse for that. Uh, and, and this actually ties in directly with what uh, my colleague Cindy Wicks is going to uh, try to walk through uh, with you. So, uh, Cindy, uh, welcome. And um, please uh, share with us uh, your, your, your thoughts and, 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 and insights uh, when we're dealing with our payers here. Sure. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, kind of break this down and, and maybe uh, go quickly through for the for first few slides here. Um, what we've seen mostly put out so far is the changes in the benefit designs, obviously taking care of our patients and our members out there. Um, and so the guidelines that came out from uh, CMS, as well as supported by the um, health plan associations that are out there, put out the guidelines uh, recommending the following. And this was put out several, several days ago with waiving test uh, cost sharing, waiving treatment cost sharing, eliminating poor uh, prior authorizations, prescription refill restrictions, um, decreasing the limitations around home or mail prescription delivery, um, and of course, access to the telehealth services that uh, my colleagues have, have uh, gone through in quite a lot of detail. Um, 
that's what we've heard mostly about. And, and all of the websites are full of what each payer is, is doing. Um, I would encourage you that you have to take a look at their websites just about daily. Um, they've got Q and A's out there. These are the next few slides we can go through real quickly, but some of the stuff they are offering is everything from, you know, um, same day, next day counseling for anxiety on these issues around that because that's building up um, extensive uh, cost sharing, not just for the Medicare population, but for commercial, their managed Medicaid. Um, pretty much I'm seeing across the board that they are offering the same thing regardless of the product line that's involved. We'll talk a little bit more if it's a, uh, uh, self-insured, self-funded, that has to be done differently. They're offering those, but of course those are individual contracts. So that's up to the employers to trigger those things, which makes your challenge a little bit more difficult because those are all individual contracts and you won't know. They, you may know that they're administered by Aetna, but you won't know whether or not they've adopted Aetna's policy. Um, so you're gonna have to constantly check on those. Cigna's offering things like, you know, free delivery of the 90 day supplies. They're, you know, putting in additional call lines to answer questions and, and get people to the right qualified um, providers. Um, you know, they're trying to do anything to help your patients that are um, immunosuppression, chronic conditions by uh, allowing them, you know, to, to get uh, virtually treated. So you're seeing a consistent theme here across all these organizations. Go ahead, uh, John. Um, in addition, because Aetna is now owned by CVS, they're even sending out care packages to those that have been diagnosed with COVID-19 that include personal and household cleaning items to keep uh, the rest of their household safe, zero co-pays on telemedicine. So, so the theme is reoccurring constantly here. We've even gotten upstate New York, CDPHP and MVP, uh, two insurers up there collaborating together. Uh, you don't see that often too often either, but to offer telemedicine services to the populations in that region. So there's a lot going on just generically um, through, throughout all of this. I will highlight though, just so that you understand this, for, for their Medicare Advantage plan, they're required to, in a, in a disaster or emergency situation, um, they have to immediately relax some of these things. So for, your, for any of your patients that are under a Medicare Advantage plan, and um, under states of emergency type of situations, they've got to cover these services um, for, for their benefits furnished at non-contracted facilities, as well as those that are in their network, so that the, so that the patients and members don't have to worry about the locations of those services. They've got to waive in full the requirement for gatekeeper referrals where applicable, and they've got to provide the same cost sharing um, for the enrollee, even if they're out uh, out of side their normal uh, facilities. So there's some changes that have to happen uh, immediately um, for a Medicare Advantage plan. So keep that in mind as you're looking at this. The other thing that came out a few days ago from the FDA, there's been a lot of controversy, obviously, and a lot in the newspapers about the lack of testing, access to testing, et cetera. FDA has now come out a few days ago and relaxed some of its normal processing um, requirements for clinical labs to get authorized and approved for, for providing these testing. If you go to the next slide, John, um, the, um, the, the Clinical Laboratory Association and, and their members that are, some of them are listed here. They are saying here, as of a couple of days ago, assuming there's no delay or shortages necessary in materials and supplies, the commercial capacity should be at 280,000 tests by April 1st. Um, that's on top of the testing that's already going on. Whether that'll be enough, who knows, but hopefully they'll ramp up quickly on that. Again, watch your, watch your payer website um, that's going to change daily. This was a snippet from the Aetna website. They are trying to keep up each payer with, with who the testing is available and when they're starting. So that's important information to pay attention to for the actual testing of this stuff and, and the resources to get testing. Uh, this slide probably should be more appropriately called how to get in touch with your payers. Um, we're hearing a lot of you having difficulty getting through. And let me break that down a little bit, having, having worked at those organizations myself for, for several decades. Um, Two sides, two sides of that. Um, there's usually you've got your contacts for claim questions. You may have separate contacts for your um, provider rep representatives or your contracting representative. So depending on uh, the, the um, payer involved, you may have different resources you can call upon. I will say this, pay attention to their website. I would do everything I possibly can to electronically do uh, document things. If they've got portals for email, submit as many of those in email as possible. 
I would encourage you to do the following. Um, if and when, and, and, I, and I hate to be the pessimist in this, but if this doesn't, uh, you know, we may, we may be in for a longer haul than we wish to be in for with, with this whole situation. Um, and you may start to have uh, staff, and they may have to start having staff that are ill. So I would start thinking about the following. Um, there have been situations, and I've done them myself, uh, with extraordinary circumstances that you may at some point think about, want to think about asking them for cash advances uh, rather than um, uh, dealing with the claims on a daily basis if it, if it comes to that. Uh, they have the capability to do that. Nobody likes to do retro claims. But under extenuating circumstances, it may be that you can put together, uh, you know, an amendment or whatever, take a look. And this is why John's information um, and the rest of the teams about the steering committee and, and, and taking a look at things is so critical. I would say this, too. I would, I would also suggest to you, I would immediately have your negotiating team that deals with your payers. Um, if you can't get through to them, I'd actually put in my own amendment together and try to... Uh, request an extension for timely filing and appeal deadlines. That could be your friend later on. I suspect everyone's going to be extremely re reasonable under the current set of circumstances, but it never ha hurts to have things documented. So I would encourage you, because every single one of your payer contracts has got a timely filing clause in it and an appeal deadline clause in it, and I would make those uh, be extended as, as far as possible and upon renewal. Um, and so I would put any of that. I would also suggest to you, if you are having trouble getting through to everybody, you may want to think about batching your questions. Um, I've seen this done before as well. Um, this largely came into when either a payer or a provider was changing claim systems themselves or billing systems, and they got behind on claims processes. Um, I was with an organization once on the, on the payer side where we were the ones changing our claim system, and we literally had appointments set up saying, batch your questions, don't call in, get me on the phone, get me all at one time. Also check your Q&A on the payer site. Uh, they've got a lot of Q&A answers out there. So you may want to approach them and see if you can get a time slot um, once a week, couple times a week. Can I batch my questions? And you may get faster results that way. Um, impact on the insurers and the ACOs, the industries um, at this point estimating this could be a $90 billion impact hit to the insurance companies. For those of you that are in ACOs out there, this is not type of mind right now, although this is um, a current conversation. Some people think there's going to be offsets because you're losing some of your um, total cost of care because people aren't getting certain services, but it'll be escalating because of the COVID-19 situation. Um, at this point, I think it's too early to tell. I will say this as of a couple of hours ago, I will say this hot off the press, the National Association of ACOs has already put in a letter to CMS. Um, some of you that are members probably got the same transmittal. Um, that they're going to try to hold, asking CMS to hold ACOs harmless for performance-related penalties in 2020 performance year, especially those of you that are in uh, two-sided risk models. Um, they're going to try to make adjustments to address this in the financial expenditures, the scoring, the patient attributions, and the risk adjustments. So more to come on this. Um, uh, definitely check out their website as a resource if you're in those. I would also say that um, uh, you also check your contracts, please, on your commercial contracts. If you've got risk contracts, you may have a catastrophic pandemic clause in there. So make sure, again, you document to your payer that uh, you'd like to execute these, uh, include these types of codes that Lori was going through uh, as part of that um, uh, reconciliation process. I would say that um, there may be some help out there, uh, even through the National Association of ACOs for stop loss and taking a look at uh, whether some of these higher claims are going to be excluded. Give me the next slide, please, John. Um, here's one thing I do want you don't forget. For those of you that are self-insured, help your own employees. As I said before, because an ACO is its own separate contract, the insurance companies can't unilaterally go out and change and offer those same membership, um, um, you know, get rid of co-pays and deductibles and all that kind of thing. You are the only ones that can do that for your own employees. So make sure you get in touch with your TPAs and insurance administrators. To make sure you can expand those and offer those same benefits to your own employees and staff. I think that's a pretty critical step. If you have not done it, um, wanted to put that on your radar screen. <clears throat> I think no, that's a level on the payer side, John. Yeah, that, that is great stuff, Cindy. And quite, quite frankly, I had not actually. Um, 
uh, considered and thought of writing the the letter to try to get some um, some help with uh, the the filing limit and you know all that, especially given that we're going to be having remote staff and the claims are going to be introduced. But uh, I think the huge takeaway is you know let's you should really start now. This is don't wait for the emergency from a cash standpoint to start get that communication with the payers and, and you know kind of develop that partnership today rather than. Uh, you know, kind of get ahead of the the game. So that sounds exactly like what you're 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 suggesting as well. Absolutely, and I'm even suggesting that your own negotiator write an amendment and send it in and see if you can get them to sign it. They're going to be swamped uh, because you are you are each one uh, provider, but they're dealing with thousands. So easier for them to if you put a piece of paper in front of them and they would agree to it. Go for it. Yeah, no, that, that that makes all the sense in the world because you know, and and one of the things I think that's important, and this is a natural segue to to start getting into, you know, the the result of the the payer relationship is is what the the business office sees and how the adjudication of the claims are, are starting to happen. So, um, you know, Lori Daigle, uh, just give, if we can, let's take a couple of minutes here and and just talk about uh, the challenges that. Um, that the business office is going to face and given all of the complications that cindy just kind of went through about some of the obstacles that are going to naturally happen here um let's just take a couple of seconds and go through and and, and talk about uh some of the important things for people to think about one of the things that Lori had mentioned and cindy had mentioned is in this changing world that we have and especially now we have all these shelter in place guidelines we're sending staff home that had never been work at homes before. So that's a challenge. Some people are good at working at home and working independently, and some people need that group around them. So understand your employees and um, kind of get a feel for what they do and how they work and what you need to do to support them in this new world. It's going to be a big, big change for them. We have challenges around the technology that's being used. Are people being forced to use their own home computers? And if they are, as Lori had mentioned, we have HIPAA compliance issues. It can't be a shared computer. It can't be something that the rest of the household has access to. We also have people in the business office, more so in, than in other areas, that are still, I like to say, they're still addicted to their paper. They're still very comfortable printing things and having notes. And even though everything is electronic, they like to have their paper to review. That's a problem when you have work at home because we have HIPAA issues. We have to make sure that we don't have paper accessible to other members of the household. So we have to think about how we're going to address that as well. We have new responsibilities for these people because they're having to be cross-trained in different areas. And then we're going to give them new responsibilities as we as everybody has been mentioning, this world is changing so drastically that we really should have your lead members for each um, insurance product start their day by checking the website of their insurance and see what is changing within their purview. What, what do they need to let their supervisors and managers know about that can then take this to the steering committee and say, hey, we have to think about these changes and how we'll manage them. We have to keep abreast of all that. Uh, so we should be giving that responsibility to um, our lead for each payer as well. Uh, clean claim rates have become really, really important. As we change these things, the payers are making decisions, but their auto adjudicators may not be keeping up with the decisions that are being made, and claims may be kicked back. So do we, we have to know what our clean claim was prior, so we can see if we're changing, we can see if we're having issues as resulting from all of this, and stay on top of it. We have to have that communication, as Lori and John had mentioned. That's key in this new world. People are doing things they've never done before in an environment they're not used to being in. So we have to make sure we give them the support, we communicate with them, and we know what's going on with them. We're going to have um, quality changes as a result of this. If you have people sent home that weren't home before, another thing to consider is they probably used to have child care, and maybe their kids are home now. So uh, is uh, they having more distractions? Is their attention to detail what it needs to be? So how are we going to monitor that and make sure we keep track of changes associated with that and quality doesn't suffer? We have to have an aggressive AR management. We have to really understand where we were before to make sure where we are now is appropriate, that we're actually capturing everything and getting the claims out appropriately. We have to be looking at these adjudication trends and the edits 
to make sure we're getting paid correctly, re review the clearinghouse edits, review um, the accounts that are in backlog. One thing we want to do is, as I said before, if you get, might have to turn off that split billing if you're provider based, but you also might have to turn off your automatic self pay because lots of payers are saying they're willing to waive cost sharing, but we want to, before we start um, just leaving the self pay on, we want to make sure that their adjudicators are catching up and they are actually paying these balances. We don't want to send them to patients if they're saying they're willing to waive it and, and capture it, but their adjudicators have not caught up with that yet. So we're going to have to look for that. The unlisted diagnoses that Lori was mentioning, you know, soon we'll have finally have a code for COVID-19, but we don't know if the payer is going to catch up that quickly. So we're going to have to look for that as well. A lot of the payers are saying they're waiving pre-authorization guidelines, but we don't know on what. So are they going to be looking for this exact COVID-19 code or the suspected COVID-19 codes? Is that what they're willing to waive their prior off guidelines on? We've got to make sure that we're getting paid appropriately for those things. Um, if, they, if you suspect it but you don't have it and all we're getting is cough and you know, maybe fever, et cetera, are they still willing to waive those guidelines? So we really have to understand that. Uh, you know, all of this comes together. We, we need to keep a handle on it. <clears throat> When we have these um, people working remotely that didn't used to, we have to figure out, as Lori had mentioned, how we're tracking their production and making sure that we're getting the same eight hours of work that we would get in the office. So it's a good idea, as she had said, know when they start, know when they finish, assign them certain blocks of work, know when they're at lunch so that we can make sure they're, you're getting the same amount of work from them at home, especially now if their kids are home and they you know, you now you have a lot more distractions at home than you would normally have with the work at home. Every day, you should have a conference call as possible with people who aren't used to being home, even if it's only two minutes or five minutes. Have a touch base with them. Set the expectations, especially those people who aren't comfortable working in a singular environment. Make sure the computers, as Lori had said, are password protected. Make sure every um, rule that you have at home I'm sorry, in the office, is in place at home. Um, make sure that you have some sort of way to identify when tasks are completed, like Lori had said. Assign them work lists. Let me know when you're done this. Um, make sure that we have the right internet connection. Is it fast enough for them to work at home? Do they have access to a shared drive in the hospital so they can log their issues and questions and everybody can maybe support one another the way they would in the office and still have that communication mechanism? Um, and as Lori had said before, utilize something like GoToMeeting. Sometimes questions don't communicate well just in an email. So have an opportunity to log onto their screen with them, look at what they're looking at, and make sure you understand the questions so that you can support them appropriately. As everybody has said before, we really need to keep that going. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Now that's, that's tremendous, Lori. Thank you. Um, you know, so as, as we try to wrap some of this stuff up, and we've got a couple of questions that um, uh, some of the participants have sent along, but, you know, we want to make sure that everyone understands, you know, the foundation of your revenue cycle is being tested unlike it has ever been before. And success in this environment, it is not going to happen by accident. It's going to depend on clear metrics and full involvement. So historically, a lot of revenue cycles get by with just who needs to be involved. It's not that any longer. We need everybody. If you look around the room and you don't have business office or coding in the room, you don't have the right team. You've got to make sure that administration, you know, makes it a priority to have access to data and makes it so that information is available and all of these things are priorities. If it's an administrative priority, things will get done. Staff has to have the ability and the skill set to monitor and stay abreast of changing regulations, payer guidelines, and policies. It's amazing. I mean, so Lori Beaudry talked a couple of minutes ago about literally, you know, 15 minutes before we started today, she came up with and said, hey, for the first time in 30 years, they've created a code that's going to be effective April 1st. That doesn't happen every day. So we need to be ready to absorb that, understand that, and talk about it. We've got to do that through a strong revenue cycle steering committee that can ensure that all of the aspects of the revenue cycle are measured and managed. Focus has to be on the impact to your patients. Keep them in your eye. We need to understand that every time you do anything in your revenue cycle, it impacts your patients. 
Make sure that communication, rescheduling appointments, and access to your hospital is simple and easy. Oftentimes when we ask patients to describe, you know, how our access to our hospital is, they never say simple and easy. Well, now we've got to make the decision that simple and easy is the key. You know, from a, a payer standpoint, we got to visit payer in, in government websites daily for benefit coding and claims processing updates. Uh, we need to make sure that we review and understand the differences between telehealth and telemedicine and understand that there's evolving guidelines and then we understand those guidelines and we can implement informed solutions that make sense to the organization and the community. We want to make sure that we review any shared savings or risk type payer contracts and amend them as they're needed, communicate to the payers as quickly as you can, set up that relationship. Maybe contact your TPA or payer administrator to change the benefit design if that makes sense to you. Again, be proactive. Do things ahead of time before you're forced into a corner. You know, communicate across all of the platforms and make sure problems are addressed and resolved. You know, so we always tell everybody constant informed action is the key, you know, and the only way to get forward is to start. So we need to make sure that the only way to ultimately improve our processes here is to focus, communicate, and innovate. So we want to make sure that we're thinking differently and we are reacting to things. Um, I want to take a couple of seconds here and uh, put out a couple of really good questions that came across. So thank you guys for, for sending these. So Lori Beaudry, we've got a question surrounding uh, the appropriate coding for a patient um, who has developed sepsis uh, due to COVID-19. And it seems as though there's some confusion just surrounding how a coder should handle that in this new world. Well, in the new world, um, there actually is a coding clinic that was published in 2016, third quarter of 2016, that says to use A4189. Although sepsis is a bacterial illness, there is no specific code for a viral, which is exactly what the COVID-19 is. So they would like you to use A4189 and along with the B9729 or the U. 07.1 when that comes into play to let the insurance payers know that the patient is now septic due to the COVID, which I hope we don't see a lot of in the United States, but it is going to happen. No, that, that's, that's terrific. Um, this question came through, and I think um, we talked a little bit about this, but I think we just need to reiterate, and this is both for uh, Lori Daigle and Lori Beaudry. You know, can you provide some further details on uh, some strategies for working from home and supervising these people, especially given, uh, like Laura, you said a couple of minutes ago, about people who just aren't used to being, um, you know, from home. Um, and and the specifically, how do we measure productivity and maybe some communication tips? So, Lori Daigle, your thoughts from a, a business office perspective. Um, one thing that I would want to stress here is that there are a lot of people who will excel in the office that will struggle at home. Some people need that environment around them in order to uh, move forward, and they, they don't, they're not as successful at home. So you really have to know your team members and support them through this because it's a big change for some people. I have had people that were extraordinary in the office, but once they go home and work at home by themselves in an isolated environment, they feel lost, and they don't have as much confidence in themselves, and they maybe get distracted more easily. So be keeping a careful eye on their production and keep in contact with them. It may not be that they are slacking off. It might just be that this environment is really difficult for them. So you want to be able to support them through that. If they're your, your stars in the office, you, you want to get them to be stars out of the office as well. So really um, be focusing on that production and watching it and support them through this. It's a big change for a lot of people. As I mentioned before, HIPAA is a big issue. Make sure you have a way to keep them separate. They may not have an office at home because they didn't think they were going to need one. So how are you keeping any paper they have secure, any information they have secure? Um, hopefully their cell phones aren't shared with other people if they're getting messages from other team members on their cell phones. Um, don't let them text each other HIPAA um, protected information. That really needs to be protected. So be thinking about all of these things. People will have their so cell phones so casually now, but make sure they know they can't put work stuff on their cell phones. It's not an encrypted device. So be thinking about things like that too. Careful, careful handle on the production guidelines. 
because people might be slipping through really because it's just an entirely different world for them. So have production benchmarks. Know what their production was before and then be monitoring carefully afterward and give them that mentoring they need to get through this time. That, that makes sense. Hey, Lori Baudry, from a coding perspective, do you have any additional thoughts to the, what Lori just mentioned? I do. To piggyback on a, something that Lori had said, what I do find interesting is that um, a lot of coders or business office staff are very used to having IT right there. They call IT, they come up, they fix their computer. They don't know how to handle their computer. So it may be that the hospitals need to um, contract with an outside communication company that can come in and set up their home computer, set up the software necessary, set up a remote desktop. When you're not having to do that every day because you're going on site, they don't necessarily know how to handle all of that. Yeah. Well, that's 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 great stuff. Um, this question came in uh, for Cindy. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions or strategies uh, for getting timely responses uh, from payer representatives, given you know the the environment that we're we're dealing in today? Yeah, as I as I said before, that's going that is going to be a challenge for sure. Um, uh, there's fewer of them and thousands of providers all trying to get attention. And as I said before, I think the best strategy at this point um, is to think about you got a couple of different people you can probably get in touch with. The contract side, you may be able to get more easy access to than your claims and your you know that day to day um, back office uh, provider representative. I will say this, I would, I would, they've all got portals, they've all got email. I would put as much stuff in writing um, because you're going to need that later on, potentially. I would do what I said before and get that extension put in your contract. Um, you may even want to add your contract person, uh, John, to the steering committee group that you got going for a rev cycle. As crazy as that sounds, if there's stuff that they can help or they can go back and renegotiate, um, I would I would go ahead and do it. And again, the proactive thing I would start now. Hopefully, you don't need some of these things, but it certainly, especially now, I'm hearing this all about the you know remote workers and everything. Production may go down, right? And and the, and the claims uh, timely filings may slip. I would say that would be my number one place to start and and go ahead and put an amendment in front of them to see if you can get it assigned because uh, uh, there's no easy way. And also consider that batch. Uh, batching questions and seeing if you can get a, uh, a defined time slot with uh, a given payer on a given day. No, that's 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 tremendous. So a, as we're wrapping up here, um, just to go through the, the panel one last time, um, you know, just if you can for everyone that's listening. For, so Lori Daigle, with your revenue cycle director and business office manager hat, uh, what is the most important takeaway that you want um, people to have uh, as they're trying to deal with this? Well, you had mentioned before um, having a steering committee, and I think that is really important, and business office has to be involved in that. They have to be letting leadership know daily what changes are happening um, with, with the payers, how the payers are responding to, you know, some regulatory things that are coming down, maybe some things that CMS is doing. Uh, what are the other payers on board with it and how are we going to manage that? That will help them, you know, understand what their future cash flow might be, what their challenges to collection might be. So they really have to be a part of that. I would, as I think I said before, have your, your lead um, billers start every day by looking at their payers' websites. It might not be something they've done before, so the supervisors might need to help them through that, but have them look at it, understand what changes are coming down and communicate that forward. Be looking at those dashboards that we talked about. Make sure that, that they create something that leadership can look at daily. Accounts billed, accounts held, revenue billed, revenue received back in, including cash payments. Um, so that how does that compare to historic? Look at registered um, accounts per department. Admissions might be going up, ED might be going up. What's what's happening for your outpatient surgery and um, ancillary services? And how is that affecting the forecasting that you had planned? Be looking mm -hmm. at your admissions to discharges. Understand your left without being seen rates from the ED. And is that a problem for you in the community? Not only for um, your business, but for the community, people that might be going back out sick because they couldn't get the care they needed. So be tracking all of these things as well. Have that touch base every day um, so that people can understand what's going on from one to the other. And one, another thing I would say that I didn't mention before 
if Cindy had mentioned reaching out to your payers, I would be reaching out to your um, governor and see if they're applying for waivers. The, the emergency 1135 waiver has given them the opportunity to apply for individual waivers. And you should be pushing them to apply for waivers that will help the hospital. They can apply for a waiver that, for instance, will increase Medicare payments, I'm sorry, Medicaid payments, or relax Medicaid guidelines for um, eligibility and even put in more presumptive eligibility. They can put in guidelines that will help you get paid for out of state because you might have payers coming into your community, I'm sorry, patients coming into your community that have Medicaid from other states with which you are not enrolled. You need to be able to get paid for those things. You can, the states can get waivers to pay for um, patients in out of state settings during emergencies. So be looking at that as well. There's a lot of things that have changed daily and be on top of it and be communicating it. No, that's, that, that, that's great stuff. Um, you know, I wanted to take a couple of minutes here just to thank everybody for participating today. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank um, uh, Lori Daigle, Lori Beaudry, and Cindy Wicks for some just tremendous content and I think a lot of stuff for us to, to take back, think about. Um, I'm hoping that you are able to print um, sections of this uh, presentation, bring it to your committee, talk to them. Uh, we've got some good uh, resources uh, and links on there, but understand that these links, everything is changing by the minute. So you got to stay abreast of it. Um, we have, uh, you know, so we at Stroudwater are here to really be your partners and really provide resources and assistance with whatever you might need. Uh, we have established a, a coding support email address. So should you have any type of co uh, questions that arose uh, from this conversation today or uh, subsequent, if you get into your revenue cycle uh, steering committee, feel free to be able to go and use that. And it's on the screen. It's at coding support at stroudwater.com. Um, you've got both Lori and my contact information. But, you know, additionally, you know, we've got, you know, here's Cindy's uh, contact and in information. So do, if you do have any questions in regards to any of the, the complex stuff that, that Cindy um, reviewed, you've got her the ability to reach out to her, have a conversation. Um, if you've got clinical or operational concerns, we've got people who have, uh, you know, just a breadth of experience to be able to, to help and make sense. Um, and again, you're going to end up having some financial and cost report concerns as things move forward. And clearly, we have uh, people who are here and ready to uh, answer the phone and, uh, you know, help you in any way, shape, or form. Um, so we want to really, uh, really extend our appreciation to you guys for, for spending the time today with us. Um, we hope that you found some value in this. Um, we hope that uh, you understand that, you know, we're all in this together and we're here to be your partner. Uh, and, you know, even the smallest of questions on any of the topics that come or stuff that we haven't addressed. I mean, we've got a team uh, that's ready and able to assist you and, and be there for you. So, um, so again, my thanks to the panel. I want to thank you guys for for your time today and the, the wonderful detail that you provided to everybody. Uh, I, Thank you all for participating um, and please, you know, stay safe. Let's, let's keep providing, you know, this wonderful care to our uh, community and, you know, we will all get through and do better on the other side. So, uh, so for now, uh, thank you very much for participating and we'll be in touch soon.